The Fantasy Six Pack Hour. With your hosts, Joe Bob. Ah, you're awful. <laughs> and AJ Applegar. It's Sin Shu Sin Shu Chu. It's a mouthful. Right, all right. Welcome to the Fantasy Six Pack Hour. My name is Joe Bond, founder of FantasySixPack.net. With me, as always, AJ Epigarth. What's up, man? I mean, besides the obvious. I don't. E- I don't even know. <laughs> I, it's I've been up since five. I'm ready to pod, ready to drink heavily, and I Fall don't know, talk about sports because there's no sports happening. Yeah. So about that. Um, <laughs> So we are recording on March 12th, and yeah, it's been a bad couple days for sports. Uh, (laughs) um, Obviously, everybody knows at this point, coronavirus is taking over everything, and it has pretty much ended sports for the foreseeable future. March Madness canceled. I am crying on the inside for that one. It is legit my favorite weekend of the year, the first opening weekend of March Madness is my favorite of the year. I, like, don't plan anything. I'm just like, nope, I'm watching basketball all weekend. My wife just deals with it. Uh, she hates it, but she deals with it. Um, you know, baseball's right around the corner, or was. You know, NBA's winding down. We're actually getting, you know, the teams starting to care. Um, it's, it sucks, man. NHL got canceled, too. Um, not canceled, but suspended or whatever. Who knows if they'll continue again. Yeah, it's it's rough, man. It's a sad time for sports. Um, but, you know, I get it. You know, health and safety comes first. You know, we already saw Rudy Gobert and a bunch of the Utah Jazz players now have it. Um, you know, who, Thanks who, to Rudy Gobert. Yeah, I know, right? Um, <laughs> uh, you know, there's no telling who else could have gotten it if sports could. I mean, Sports are a contact sport. I mean, anybody that could get it, you know, it's whatever. Symptoms don't show up for however long, apparently, or whatever, from what I'm reading. So it's, you know, you could have it for a couple of days and not know and go play a game, and then boom, the entire team has it. So I get it. It just sucks as a sports fan. It sucks as somebody who, you know, tries to run a sports blog. It's going to be a rough month. Yeah. It's going to be a rough month. <laughs> I got a whole lot of nothing to do. <laughs> so that being said, yeah. man, let's move on. Um, introduce our guest here, Jonathan Chan. What is up, man? Uh, obviously not much, guys. Um, <laughs> not much content to put out when this is happening. No, you know, we're going to try our best to, to keep it somewhat active. You know, the baseball season is going to start <laughs> eventually. Um, at least we think. So we'll keep some stuff rolling, but it's not going to be as daily as it was. I mean, we kind of ran out of content, to be honest. We, we planned it to end <laughs> next week. So we've got some stuff in the works, but it's not a ton. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll make it work, though. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll get some stuff out there. We'll hopefully, we'll try to pod next week anyway, just because, you know, AJ said, ready to pod I, and ready and to the worst, the <laughs> worst part about it. Uh, uh, about the cancellation of March Madness, I obviously is in general not having March Madness. But I was I was literally going to bring up to you, hey, maybe we should just do like a live recording while we're watching the games <laughs> and whatever. Like I had to I had to look back at our schedule to see what we actually had planned. But uh, that's probably not happening. No, I mean, absolutely I don't not even know happening. If places will be open by next week. <sighs> I don't know. Yeah, no idea. So uh, we can anyway. watch we, golf with no fans. Uh, yeah, I mean at least it's, it's kind of a quiet kind sport of, anyway, so that works. <laughs> Who kind knows? of the same as watching golf anyway. But, <laughs> <I feel like. laughs> Except after those, you know, tiger tiger confidence putts or whatever, yeah, you know, from the game, it's like all right. Well, there's no clapping. I guess <laughs> I can just focus on my game. NASCAR still going. Oh yeah, they they're not gonna care. I'm like, we'll drink it away. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Alright. Let's get on with it. Beer of the week. Mm. 
Beer. Jonathan wanted to join us for this one, so Jonathan, what you got, man? Uh, my beer is it's called High Grass. Uh, it's like a mix of lemongrass and ginger. It was a random one I found in my fridge. Pretty sure I stole it from my friend after a party. All right. Uh, uh, it's okay. Good. It's kind of refreshing. I can see myself drinking it in summer. It's not really a nighttime winter beer, but it, it's acceptable. Hey, free beer is always the best beer, right? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. All right, AJ, what you drinking? All right. Um, I have drank this one on the show, but I don't think I've actually highlighted it in Beer of the Week. Um, it is the Flying Dog Thunder Peel Hazy IPA. All right. Nice orange can here. Flying dog to match my sweet chalkboard that I still never write on yet. And orange to match my saddened Flyers shirt here because stupid NHL decides to cancel when they're having basically a Stanley Cup season. So makes 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 sense. Sure. All right. I'm drinking a... Uh, I got the Stone Pack again from the store because they had a new one in there called... Die Hard Fan IPA. Uh, I think it's got mosaic and citra hops in it. I definitely know it's got mosaic. Um, might have citra in here too, but it's pretty tasty. Um, it's kind of light, um, but it, but it goes down pretty easy, especially for a 7.7. 7. Um, so I like it. I think I'm gonna give it a three and three quarters on on untapped. So good stuff, man. All right, let's get right to it here. We got our. Uh, our pitcher preview this this week. We're going to just cover starters and relievers together here and not really break them up. So right here right off the bat, the strategy. Um, so for me with draft strategy, right, this year, in general, I, I want at least – I would love to get one of these, like, top three or four guys, um, although we'll talk about a couple of them later on. Maybe they're not top three or four anymore. Um, but you know, in general, I would love to land one of these top three or four guys. Will I, in most cases, probably not. I'll settle for like a top 10 and then I'll probably reach again for like a top 15, top 16 guy. I'll have like two guys right then, right there, back to back. Um, and then after that, like, there's just a lot of guys that I think are, are very good value. You can find strikeouts late. Um, you know, once, once you get past the tier one, tier two guys, I think you're going to find that generally ratios are kind of the same. You know, they start ticking up a little bit, you know, the higher you go, but it's not drastic where you're like, oh, you know, if I miss, you know, this guy here, I'm screwed. You know, I'll just take the next guy really is what it, what it becomes. But ultimately with, with starting pitching, it, it is a mix of, I love high strikeout guys more than anything. Because that's a counting category and it's more reliable. You can kind of count on strikeouts for, for most guys. I don't chase ratios, but I also don't go after guys who walk a lot. Like walk walk rates are bad. Like I don't want those guys because they're inevitably going to be guys that their uh, their whips go way up or we're already up. And and then you know maybe they had a decent ERA last year, but. That catches up. When you walk a lot of guys, it catches up with you, and your ERA will bloat. Um, so I, I look at that when I'm looking at chasing ratio. I don't look at last year's ratio and go, oh, he's going to repeat. No, hell no. I look at walk rates. I look at swinging strike rates. I look at things like that, you know, ground ball rates, bat bips, and things like that against the pitcher, and d- decide for myself if it's if it's going to repeat. Um, you know, I do look at the projections to see if I'm kind of in the right ballpark, um, see maybe why I was – agreed with it or disagreed with it um but that's kind of what i do um for starting pitching for for relief pitching i'll never have the top two or three closers in any league unless they drop i just i never reach for those guys i i you know i love the you know those guys are awesome they're usually great and reliable every year but i can find closers i'll mix and match um you know i usually want at least one reliable guy like i'll take one top 10 guy um, somebody who I think I can count on all year long. Uh, and after that, I might grab, like, um, I never want anybody in, like, the lowest tier just because those guys are total crapshoots. You never, like, I never want to draft Wade Davis <laughs> uh, you know, or the likes of, 
you know, the, the guy in the same ta- territories. You know, I, I don't want the Michael Gibbons. I don't want anybody from the Marlins type of thing. Because like, you just don't know. You don't know what you're getting. They're not going to get you enough saves anyway. Um, so in, in that case, you know, I might grab like one more guy in like the tier. Or if somebody, you know, the, one of the last two tiers drops far, I'll grab him. Kind of mix him with my with my top closer. And then I'm going to cherry pick off the waiver wire. Because inevitably someone's going to pop up. Um, yeah, I might even t- I might even draft depending on how deep the league is. I might even draft one of these really good relievers and the, who could slide into a role like a Scott Oberg or something like that, um, and and just hold on to him because the ratios and the strikeouts will be good. And then as soon as he gets the closer role, which I inevitably think he will, then it's just a bonus. So it's kind of how I roll with it. Uh, Jonathan, do you have anything different, or do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, uh, kind of similar thing. Like with the closers, I don't chase uh, like top closer. I do think this is the one year. Like with Hater, I think he he can be worth a higher pick just because he's guaranteed like 100 strikeouts, you know, 30 saves, that kind of thing. But uh, in general, I don't really chase saves. Uh, with the starters, uh, I do like. I do agree that you need uh, top ish tier. I don't know about the top three or four because I think those guys uh, with the injuries to Sale. And uh, and Verlander, I think the top four guys are gonna start jumping in ADP. I don't think it's gonna it's create a little in value there. But the second tier guys like um, like Bieber and Strasburg and guys like that, those are the guys I'm really uh, targeting in that second tier there, just because it, it, they are good anchors for the rotation and they can still produce uh, really well at a better price than guys like Bueller and Cole. Yeah, I, you guys pretty much hit it on the head. I don't. I, I kind of follow the same guidelines there. I I do like having better relievers, um, and I'm not afraid to go after them earlier and often, um, depending on my league. But you know, it, it, for the fantasy six pack league at least, you know, we have the four pitcher slots and then two reliever slots and three starters. <clears throat> My other league is five starters and only two relievers. So in that league, I'm not really focused on the closers as much. Well, um, most leagues now are like eight or nine pitching spots. These are straight pitcher spots. So that's even yeah. dip more different. Like you don't have to – like you can choose. You can either just hammer home relievers and go after a lot, really good ratios. You're never going to win yep. strikeouts. You're never going to win wins or quality starts. But you're going to win ratios. You can – crush saves or saves and holes depending on what it is so yeah i mean i i do like that i and in points leagues it could be different too so that's a different ball game but you know we're not going to go down that road yeah <clears throat> so cool deal all right well let's get into our uh, our topics and questions and uh we'll start with a guy here that the jonathan brought up already and that is chris sale so obviously last year chris sale um, ended with the shoulder or elbow, elbow injury. And, um, you know, it's, it's cropped right back up on him. And so not good news. You know, it, for a while there, everybody just was goodbye. You're getting Tommy John. Somehow does not need it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but last year, I mean, like, honestly, wasn't even that good of a year. He started out horrendous. Um, people were ready to like drop his ass, and it was crazy. Um, but you know, he kind of came back around. The strikeouts were there. The crazy thing, though, is with Sale was that like the strikeouts were there, all the ratios, um, other ratios were like the WHIP was still good, the walk rate was still really down, the strikeouts were really high up. Um, everything was there, but he just got hammered by the home run ball. So, but a mix of that. And the injury, right, kind of made people back off this year and drafts a little bit. Um, but, he, I mean, he was still going, like, I don't know, top 10 pitcher, I'd say. <clears throat> and, but, Jonathan, I, I want to know with you, like, with this injury, of course, it changes with the whole delay of the season because we don't really know when it's starting. Of course, we don't know how long Sale is really out either. Um, you know, when are you comfortable taking a Sale at this point? Or is he just totally off your board? You don't want anything to do with him no matter what. Uh, a guy like Sill, you can't completely take off your board. Uh, right now on NFBC, he's at 109, so he's dropped to that high upside tier uh, just past the hundreds with uh, Luzardo, Frankie Monta, Zach Gallen, guys like that. 
I think at that spot, I'm willing to take him depending on. Uh, well, if the season was on a regular schedule, that reevaluation that he's under, that he's going to go under, it would have been in time for opening day, so you can kind of see what uh, what he's going through. But right. um, in that tier, I'm willing to take it because you know uh, the kind of pitcher that he can be, and he has a higher upside than anybody else in that uh, in that range. Of course, even if <clears throat> sorry. Yeah, of course he does. <laughs> yeah, and anybody that you're taking in that range, like, you know, all these younger guys, they're going to have innings limits anyways. So they're going to get shut down. You're going to lose innings from them anyways. And in that range, sale is an easy, easy take. Yeah, I... Sale's probably not someone I'm going to own at all this year. Um, I just don't like injuries. And he's kind of coming off of just I feel like multiple years of, of injury issues even if they're little nagging things and he's just got such a long lanky body with his delivery it's like mm, you knew something was going to happen at some point so the fact that it's an elbow um, or I'm sorry not wait yeah he's dealing with elbow again right mm-hmm. yeah yeah sorry all right had another note right in front of me that was screwing me up um <laughs> I, I just, yeah, I, I don't like elbow issues on anybody. So I probably won't own any sale. Um, so next guy we got listed here, speaking of injuries, uh, Justin Verlander. Um, he has a strained lat, and it was last reported that it would take a miracle, quote-unquote, for him to be ready for opening day regular schedule. Um, that was the original opening day, obviously. So same question above i mean now that we have another two weeks to kind of wait and see if uh you know this miracle comes for verlander are you where are you looking at him draft wise jonathan um it again it depends on what the reevaluation what the reevaluation looks like uh, my concern with this is that they initially diagnosed it as tricep soreness and now it's apparently a lat strain i don't really know how you get those confused uh as a athlete him experiencing the soreness himself and the doctor not really sure how he can confuse those but sure um uh like again it all depends on how he feels after it but if i'm drafting today i'd probably knock him down uh quite a bit just because of his age and we know that he was healthy over the last couple of years he's been great in houston but uh, this is one of those things that can affect his velocity throughout the year. I'd probably knock him down a few tiers into like the Darvish Nola area, uh, based on how how many innings he could play. All right, fair. Joe, any thoughts on Verlander? Yeah, I mean, I, honestly, I, I don't really know yet. Like, I just wish we had more information. I, I think if I was drafting today, I'm probably still drafting him. You know mid second round at this point just because you know we've got a couple weeks and then at that point who knows if we even play in the middle of april it could be the end of april and then maybe at that point he's healthy um i I think i would take that risk if i was drafting today um now if something came out obviously and that and that news changed then definitely not Uh, but it's it's one of those i i'm willing to take a risk on on a guy like him who can just totally be you know the number one pitcher in all of baseball if if he's right yeah i mean he's definitely shown it that he's dominant when he's healthy so i think he's still worth a high pick personally but i might still drop him down a little bit yeah i'm looking at i'm trying to pull up my computer's being really slow right now but i'm pulling up nfbc drafts over the, just the last like five days and he's going as pitcher number seven in toward the end of the second round now doing 12 team leagues um so like he's number 23 overall so still I, pretty I, solid. I still think i'd do it you know if he if yeah he, he's going he's going right after flaherty and bieber you know the other you know bueller Degrom, scherzer going all ahead of him still too so it's it's interesting, you know. I think I would take the, the. I, th- I think I'd bite there too. So, moving on here to the guy who was 
clearly just straight up dominant last year. Uh, former teammate of Justin Verlander, Garrett Cole, New York Yankee now moved teams. We talked about him a little bit on the uh, initial show for to start to start the year out with um, Howard Bender. I mean, there's not much else to say about this guy except for the last like two years he's just been a street stud. Um, you know. Jonathan, with the move to New York, though, is he still the clear number one guy off the board for you for pitching? Um, you can make an argument that he should be just because, as you said at the start of the show, he has the strikeouts, like that counting stat that you can count on. You know he's going to strike out uh, probably one of the higher K-9s for any any starter. The problem, well, what you can consider with the ratios, you don't know what uh, what's going to be like pitching in Yankee Stadium consistently. You don't know if he's going to get hurt because apparently the Yankees' medical staff is awful. Um, <laughs> but it, he's if he's not the clear-cut one, he's one A. Uh, you right. can't take anything away from Degrom, who's won two straight Cy Youngs. The ratios are always low, and you know if if the Mets you know can be an average team offensively, then Degrom could win like 15 games. Absolutely. So it's not the difference isn't massive to me, but I think. Cole is probably the safer option because you have that consistency with the strikeouts. I tend to agree. Yeah, Quality it's... starts league, it's the Grom though, but AJ, what you got? Yeah, definitely the Grom and quality. Um, I mean, being an owner of him in our league as a fifth round pick, I think this year, I'm I'm happy to have the top pitcher. I was trying to dump him on some people, but nobody was taking him, so you know, whatever. But I, I kind of had to have him last year to even get by in that league. And I mean, he stepped up and he played awesome. Uh, I do think it'll be interesting with him being with the Yankees, though. I mean, obviously when healthy they have one of the best offenses in the league but we talked about judge and stanton last week we already know that their issues um here again with this uh corona shutdown does that help them probably a little bit but you know i i just think cole's been so dominant with houston and I think that it'll still translate over. I don't see him just all of a sudden reverting mm. back to what he was and, and, and wasn't, in a sense, uh, in Pittsburgh. So I, I'm happy to have him where I have him and love that that's where I get to get him there. But I probably won't own him in any other league, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I did snag him in the... TGFBI. Um, I had the tenth pick out of fifteen, or maybe it was twelfth. I forget. But I got him pretty late in the first round, which I was pretty shocked on because pitching in those leagues usually goes pretty early. So I was happy to pounce on Cole at that point. Yeah. So, moving on from Cole, we will talk about Mister Mad Max Scherzer. Um, also a top pitching option here. So he dealt with neck injuries last season. He's now dealing with a, a quote-unquote ailment in his side. Um, uh, Jonathan, how much are you worried about him entering 2020 season? Uh, sure, is probably the pitcher injury-wise I'm least worried about. Uh, he pitched on Tuesday, or he like threw, threw a bullpen on Tuesday. He didn't feel any pain. Um. He's gonna, he was going to be ready for the regular opening day. So a pushed back opening day, I'm not worried about him at all. And it does help. Uh, they're, they're pushing the schedule back. It does take off some of the, uh, the fatigue and the like the, just the workload he had with the World Series run last year. So I think Scherzer, you don't have to worry. Locked and loaded top, top three option. Uh, yeah, no more pain. Now he gets fewer starts, fewer innings, and he's going to be, you know, Max Scherzer again. Yeah. Thoughts, Joe? Yeah, I, I don't disagree. I mean, the the one thing you got to worry about is like, you know, it seems like with pitchers, you know, the back and neck area just seem to be nagging injuries. I mean, we've seen it with Kershaw, right? Um, but, I mean, Max was able to come out and pitch a little through it. Now, he did struggle at times at the end of last year and even through the playoffs. Um, but, 
yeah, I think you're right. It, he seems like he's he's headed in the in the right direction, and this delay is only going to help his help, help him. So, you know, if, if he falls like a couple spots in the pitching ranks in your drafts because people are worried about it, uh, I would just fall all over that. Like, just go for it. So, moving on to uh, another what we think is a top guy, but I'm honestly not really sure here. Um, you know, Blake Snell, a couple years ago, had an amazing season. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Last year, came crashing back down to earth. You know, only 107 innings, did get injured, right? 4.29 ERA. The strikeouts were phenomenal. I mean, 147 in 107 innings. Um, I hope I typed that right. It seems pretty unbelievable. But, you know, just pretty amazing strikeout numbers. You know, he got an injection on the inside of his elbow, and we talked about this when the injury was first reported. I just happened to be listening to the radio the day that the news came out, and Stefania Bell was on the radio, and she was mentioning that you know the fact that the injection was on the inside of the elbow is like fantastic news. That that means it's not like the UCL. It's not you know it's not anything that's going to cause Tommy John. It's nothing to worry about. It's literally just like inflammation of whatever. So they injected him, and apparently he feels fine. I mean, how much do you trust that you know come draft time? You know when it comes time to his name being near the top of the board, Jonathan. Uh, I'm gonna let it be known now. I'm not a big Blake Snell guy. Uh, even after his uh, like the really good year, I didn't really trust it. Um, he had too many issues the year before, like with the walks and stuff that weren't. Right. I didn't think were sustainable. Like his, even between last year and the year before, like his uh, his BABIP jumped from 241 to 343. Uh, the left on base dropped 17 percent. Uh, just between the years, I think a lot of it was uh, a lot of luck based in his good year. I think he'll probably be somewhere in between uh, last year and and the uh, and the Cy Young year, but not somebody I'm willing to take uh, as early as he's going, especially after his uh, disastrous first uh, sp- spring training appearance, which didn't go didn't go super well for him. He has a 27 ERA in the spring, so not not super thrilled about Snell. There's too uh, too many variables there for me to for me to trust him. Yeah, I I agree with that, and um, I, I was thinking of possibly using him as my overvalued pick for for later when we get to that section. But I I peeled back from that because I knew we were talking about him here. Um, again, it's a guy I have in in one of my other leagues as a keeper, but he's super late round, so I think I'll take him as a seventeenth rounder, but he does worry me. He absolutely destroyed me last year with the injuries and, and just piss poor play when he was on the field. So I think it's hard to, to look past that along with his, you know, pre Cy Young pitching where he just really wasn't that good. So I I don't know. I mean, he, he put it all together a couple years ago. Maybe he can do that again this year. Um, and and hopefully you know pay back his uh his fans that that draft him in the you know third round basically so that's my thoughts on him but moving on uh we got some Shoei Otani I mean this guy's a pretty weird case you know he wasn't supposed to pitch until May now that might only be two weeks into the season or less because of not knowing when the season's technically starting. But do you think his ability to pitch increases his value for you, or are you just more relying on on his bat at this point? Um, Jonathan, sorry. Yeah, uh, I just think with his, you know, all the injury stuff coming up, I think even with his bat where he's currently going, I think that's a fair price. I think NFBC has him at 140 uh, when mm-hmm. I checked this morning, uh, yeah. which is completely fine. I mean, it depends what format you're playing. Does Yahoo still keep him as two separate players? You know, uh, I'm not sure. I meant to look all that up today, but it was a, a pretty checked. whirlwind day um, for me. Yeah, yeah that's uh, a good so, point. Uh, but yeah, if he if he's dra- if he's one player, like you get both the batter and the pitcher, I think he's 
far more valuable than where he's being drafted. There being are some have... leagues. I know Fantrax only has him as a DH now. So he's going to have to earn really? back his pitching he's eligibility. Earned his... Wow, okay. Yeah, it's pretty yeah, crazy. Well, that makes count... sense. But he didn't pitch last year. I know. Well, I mean, that's what Yahoo should, in theory, do the same thing. It depends on the league, though. But are they going to have to create a, a brand new player then? Because Yahoo, they count him as two players. Now, he if he pitches, you know, the ten or five games, do they have do they would they have to create an entire new player who player who would go through waivers? I think they would. Yeah, I oh, think that's so. So stupid. Because yeah, you know he's going to pitch, waste, but you oh, know he's yeah. going to pitch. Like if I want to draft him, I should be able to do so. But anyways, if he's one player, uh, he's way more valuable than his one forty ADP is. Uh, injury, if he pitches or not. He's still, if he plays every game, like a 30 home run guy. Yeah. So, and that's worth way more than now. And right. if he pitches, then you're just adding extra value on for free, basically. Um, if he does, you know, he might not pitch 170 innings, but you're looking at mid three ERA with a K9 over nine. So, very solid stuff um, for, for a dual thread player. Yeah, I like Otani. Um, I, I like the upside of the bat, obviously, and and if he is going to pitch, depending on, you know, how that pans into everything, if they just do him like a, almost as like a sixth pitcher, and or, or random weeks where they have, you know, off days and whatnot, if they can make it work that way, with the batting and keep him in the lineup, almost daily for batting then I really like him, and, and I love him above that ADP. What yeah, think, it, it's to me it's tough because I just – I really have to have the perfect team to be able to draft a, a utility-only player, and he's just not going to get outfield eligibility from what I can understand. So it's tough. Like That means every time you play him, he's only a, a, a DH eligible. Um, he's only got a pitch you know, maybe once a week if that in some cases. Um, yeah. So I kind of think the ADP is right where it should be. Um, I mean, it's why the guys like Nelson Cruz go really late, right? I mean, Nelson Cruz has been amazing. But it's hard to have those guys that can't go anywhere else if, you know, it's just it's really hard. Um, I would have to have a ton of multiple eligibility ability bit multiple eligibility players um, on my team who can move around all sorts of different positions um, to be able to take somebody like Otani where he's going. Uh, I just, you know, I'm just not buying into it. I mean, he, he's good. Um, I just, it, I, it's more of a team composition thing for me, and, and that's really, I don't look at so much like, oh, he's the best value. It's like, is he a good fit for my team? too i think there's more to that than people get into you know and, and that's one of the reasons why i think i'm slightly successful with a lot of my leagues is because i like a team composition um i don't just blow it up because oh that's a i'm getting the best player over here you know especially i don't i don't trade this player for this player because oh i'm getting the better value it's like well now i'm left with a crappy second baseman i don't want that um type of thing so that's i, I look at that a lot more than Maybe some people do, it seems like. so. All right, moving on. Trevor Bauer. Um, I know, Jonathan, you own this guy in our uh, Dynasty slash Keeper League, whatever we want to call it. It's not really a Dynasty League because we don't keep everybody. We only keep 25 of 40. But for the sakes of the show, let's call it Dynasty because they do. Um, like Entering 2019, this guy was a top 10 pitcher. His 2018 was incredible well under a 3 ERA, uh, 221 strikeouts and 175 innings, 12-6 and six record, was just lights out. Um, 2019 was not kind to him. 4.5 ERA. Strikeouts were really nice. 253 and 213 innings pitched, you know, right up there with the year before. Yeah, got traded, just <laughs> threw a ball over the wall from the pitching mound, like... Crazy stuff, man. Um, you know, can we expect a bounce back to the 2018 season, or are we looking more at the latter with him going forward? I think you're probably looking somewhere in the middle. I don't think he's as bad 
uh, as he was last year. He pitched through a bunch of ankle injuries to start the year and stuff like that. Um, I mean, his home run rate in 2018 was ridiculously low. It was like home his home runs per nine was like point four six or something, and then last year jumped to one point four four. So he gave up a lot of home runs last year. I think that's going to down a bit. <laughs> Um, he, he's even, you know, if the ERA stays above four, which is, I don't think it will, but he's still a good strikeout guy. He doesn't walk a lot of people. Uh, he pitched 200 innings last year. I think only 10 guys did that. Uh, so, you know, you're going to get innings. You're going to get the counting stats with the strikeouts and stuff. I think with Bauer, I think, uh, just going through fan graphs, I think a lot of his stuff came down to pitch mix. Uh, he threw a lot of cutters last year, um, instead of his curveball, which is weird because with his... Curveball, he was opposing batters are hitting 168. Uh, and against the cutter, they're hitting like 323 or something like that. And just maybe he couldn't throw the curve because of an injury. He didn't want to. He just felt like he didn't need it. But if he throws the pitch mix back closer to, tw- to 2018, I think we're going to see a good size bounce back from, from Bauer. Yeah, Jay, what do you think? Yeah, I I think I like Bauer this year too. Uh, I say I think I do because I don't know if I've ever actually owned the guy, but I've always seen him and followed him and and wondered why I never owned him. Um, so I, I I think I'm gonna try to go after him as much as I can this year. Uh, I mean that the, the stats are awesome, and for even playing in Cincinnati, which is a pretty heavy hitter park. I mean, that's that's awesome, awesome output. So, I mean, the, you can see it up there. The FIP is a little higher than the ERA, so you know there's potential regression there. Um, but I still think that that he pitched really well. I'm sorry, that was that was a uh, 2018 stats I'm looking at. Yeah, the one thing I worry right. about with with Bauer is that, I mean, I. I wonder if we all kind of jumped the gun a little too quickly on the the 2018 breakout, and we'll get to a guy a little later that's kind of similar to this, um, to where, I mean, for five seasons before that, he had ERAs in the fives, in the fours, in the fours, in the fours, in the fours. They had a 2.21. Oh, and then he returned to the fours. Like, how do we not see that coming? And all the strikeouts were amazing, not as amazing as they were in 2018 and even 2019. But I just worry, like, what what gave, like, in 2018 that he was amazing? You know, maybe he tinkered with his pitch, uh, you know, uh, his pitch selection, like you're, you're mentioning, Jonathan. Uh, but why would you mess with it if it worked so well in 2018? So, like... I think Trevor Bauer is kind of a head case a little bit, in my opinion, and he thinks he's a little he's a little too cocky, a little too full of himself, and he thinks he can get away with whatever. Maybe he goes back to the 2018 pitch selection and he's amazing again, but I think I'm steering on the side of he's been a, a four-plus ERA guy six out of his seven years. Um, it, the outlier here is 2018, and I'm not buying into it. Even kind of an in-between buying into it. I'm buying into maybe a low fours at best, in my opinion. And the projections say better, but they're still like high threes, so it's not far off. Uh, I think the strikeouts will be there around 177 overall. Cool. But it's, yeah, it's he's probably not going to be on, on many of my teams. So... Yeah, mine either. Now that I see that the 2018 was first and the 2019 was second. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Whoops. Way to read. Anyway, moving on. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'll just call him Ryu because I don't know if I'm going to say Hyunjin right. If that's even right, I think you I did know. it. You're good. But so he's the most durable he's ever been in four seasons and he pitched 182 and two thirds innings last year with a 232 ERA he was second in the Cy Young voting. Um, now he moves over to the blue Jays. I don't think a repeat can be expected, but what do you think, Jonathan? Uh, I think, I don't think you're expecting a repeat of like a 232 ERA, but 
his ADP is like criminally low. Like he's pitcher, like it's no. He's getting drafted in the area of guys like Max Fried and Sonny Gray. Come on. Like Sonny Gray's yo yoed between ERAs of five and three and a half over the last four years. Freed's had what one year? He's getting drafted three four spots ahead of James Paxton, who we know is missing time. <laughs> Like we know Touché. Paxton's missing a month and a half. Why is yeah. no? It it doesn't make any sense. It's could way too long. It'll be two weeks now. So no, it could be two weeks. But <laughs> before all this happened, yeah. Um, like when he pitches, he's he's good. The highest ERA he's ever posted, um, is three point seven, which is oh outside of the four innings he pitched in two thousand sixteen, which his ERA was like eleven or something. But uh, he's had a sub ERA last year. He had one point nine seven. Or sorry, 2.32, and then he had the year before, he had 1.97. We know he's good, it's just health. Realistically, if he gets hurt, maybe you get 150 innings out of it. But if you get 150 innings out of somebody who gives you a th- low threes ERA, isn't that worth a little bit more than, you know, the 135th pick? That's hot, like, what, low end as your second starter? It's, I don't know, people are too scared of the injury stuff. And I th- I think Ryu is one of the one of the one of the b- best values in drafts. Honestly, this is not a Jays thing, by the way. Uh, I was gonna say oh, it's not a Jays thing. I I, I wasn't. I, a re- I do legit worry about him in that ballpark. I mean, not only is he gonna be able be playing in, you know, the AL East, where yeah, the offenses may not be that great, but the ballparks are still just like. All of them are hitters' ballparks. I mean, no doubt about it. Um, I think the turf is going to hurt him more than anything in Toronto. He's a ground ball pitcher. Um, yeah, he strikes out a fair number of guys, but that's not his game. His game is pitch the contact, get the guys out, limit the damage. Um, that turf is going to be murderous for him. So I really do buy into the fact that the projections have his ERA jumping a full run and plus some. I think that's what we're going to see. Now, is it still too low, his AAP? Sure, I do like him way better than a Sonny Gray who I just despise. Like Soroka, like, come on, guys. Like, this is ridiculous. Um, uh, or not Mike Soroka. Sorry, I'm, I'm looking at the wrong... I'm looking at the wrong... <laughs> Uh, I was like, wait a minute, that name doesn't make any sense. I'm looking at the wrong part of the David Price. I mean, like, are we really buying into David Price? Like, Kyle Hendricks is boring. I mean, I don't know. Like, I like him around that range, but probably better than most of those guys. Um, so, he's going to have some good games, but I think he's going to get torn to shreds in a few other games. And it's going to inflate his ERA big time. I will say, though, even with the turf, they've the Rogers Center has been messing with the turf. It's closer to real grass now, and the Jays' uh, infield defense isn't bad. I know Vlad's a little slow, but he's got a good arm. Uh, Bichette's great. Biggio's great. So I think the infield defense is fine. Uh, I think they can mask a lot of the uh, the ground ball issues. Yeah, but I mean, you know better than us. You're a Toronto Toronto fan up there, so. Uh, all right. Interview. Anything to add, or you just want to move on? No, I'm good. All right. So, moving on here, Brandon Woodruff, um, guy that I want to – I didn't – for some reason, I didn't look it up. I have a super crazy busy day. But uh, I was, he started last year on the IL, right? Um, came in oh, and, cool. like, was pretty dominant. Um, the ERA was a little bit higher, but I, like – I think it was like just like one or two starts that really made it as high as it was, but it's still not even that high, like a 3.6. Whip was 114. 143 strikeouts and 121 innings with 11 and 3. I mean, this guy was awesome. The FIP was 3.01. Um, projections have him going around the 6th, 7th round, depending on you know what size league you're in. Um, I mean, how much are we buying into last year uh you know being kind of kind of a small breakout for him you know is you know is he worth this adp knowing that he had has that on his record now uh i think with his adp is 
it's it's high for a breakout of only you know 120 innings, but there are signs that he was, you know, the breakout was was real. Like he, his velocity increased by you know a full uh, one mile per hour over 2018. Uh, his strikeout to walk, uh, or strikeout minus walk was 22.9, which is like 15th uh, of anybody over 100 innings. Um, you know, he gave up not many barrels uh, at all. I think he was like the the least uh, the least amount of barrels uh, of of pitchers with over 300 batting uh, like batted ball events. So he limits hard contact. He can throw it pretty hard. He's got the stuff. It's just can he stay healthy? I don't think we have a long enough track record to say he can't. Mm-hmm. But you never know if they're gonna you know limit his innings, make sure he can stay healthy. But I think at 80, he's he's a fine pick in that area based on you know who else is available yeah i think woodruff's a an interesting case because you would think that he's going to be definitely starting but because of the innings and again granted it was partially due to injury but you know is he one of those guys that could potentially have an innings limit at some point um seems doubtful i mean like uh, you, you yeah guys, i mean you, i you think he's guy. kind of on the cusp but probably past it so you could see down the stretch maybe some you know missed starts or skipped starts not necessarily missed um or or just have him go in, into the bullpen for a little bit and then come back again later um but for where he's getting drafted you know I think it's still worth it. I I mean... Well, so I want to ask you guys. So we've talked about it, and I think I misspoke earlier. I I think I messed up on the slide when I did it earlier and didn't update it from a previous one. Um, So Trevor Bauer is going at 77. Brandon Woodruff is going around 80. Which one would you rather have? Jonathan, you go first. Well, if you... Oh, yeah, go ahead, Sorry. Uh, I'd probably go Bauer just because, I mean, discounting injury, you know he's going to go as many innings as he can. Probably argue with the manager to go even more innings than he should be going. <laughs> he's going to strike out, of course. you know, 200-plus guys. The volume is going to be there. And like I said, like Woodruff's being projected by Steamer right now for a 405 ERA. Like I think Steamer had Bauer, what, around the same area, high threes, low fours. But uh, I think Bauer gets more volume. Yeah, so... Yeah, even if you just go was. by projections, Bauer ERA is lower. I put a one. Lower. I put a one in front of the seventy-seven for some reason with Bauer, so it was a one seventy-seven on the side. I just fixed it. I'll take him at one seventy-seven. <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's seventy-seven. I, I was like, oh hell yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Four ERA at one seventy-seven. So fix it on the fly, a little, little, you know. <laughs> no. I, I think no, Bauer's a workhorse. He, he'll go two hundred innings, you know, barring any injuries, and you're going to get pure volume. You know what, you, what you're getting. The upside sure. is there, yeah. And you, you've already seen his downside. So, well, plus the other thing too, he's basically already said, "I'm going to tell you what I'm throwing, and <laughs> you have to hit it." Uh, again, it goes back into his cockiness, but I kind of <laughs> want to see that. <laughs> Um, and just I don't know if I want to own watch. that though. Like, <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. It's like, hey, I'm throwing you a fastball down the middle. I don't Hit it. See it. Okay. I don't Bye. have any <laughs> other pitches this year. I'm only throwing fastballs. <laughs> 240 innings worth of straight fastballs. Oh my God, I will need two off. seasons off for Tommy John. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> so he's Josh Hader. Now he's we're moving yeah. to Hader territory. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's interesting. So, uh, All right. But, yeah, Woodruff, I mean, between the two, I I think I might go Woodruff um, just to see, you know, if, if Steamer's got him at 200 strikeouts, you know, yeah, you get potentially 30 more. I mean, across a whole season, you can make that up somewhere else, um, whether it's through some random streaming or – you know, potentially stockpiling some better relievers that are more strikeout guys. So I'm not really as worried about that. Um, I I just like the upside. I think the Brewers are a better team than Cincinnati too. So I think the wins (laughs) uh, are are more relevant, I guess, coming that way. But yeah, 
I, I think you know it's it's a tough call, but I'd rather go with the younger arm than the consecutive high ERA after high ERA after. Oh shit! I figured it out for a year. Oh, never mind. Are you guys really gonna make me be the tiebreaker here? <laughs> I was hoping you guys would just do it. Uh, yes, I'm going Woodruff. Sorry, I was a little burned by Bauer last year in our in our fantasy six pack league. Yes, I won the league with Bauer, but uh. Dude, he was not the reason I won that league. <laughs> not even by a long no. shot. <laughs> I had so no. many like value picks that just blew up last year, and uh, Bauer was not one of them. He was my first pitcher off the board. I had both. Uh, I had both yeah. Cleveland guys. Uh, you had him, and you had uh, Degrom. Was well, I traded second. for I traded for Degrom, but I had. Um, Carrasco oh, did I have Carrasco? Is that oh. what it was? I had Carrasco and Bauer, and they both like. Well, Carrasco almost died on me, literally. Um, Bauer, you know, crapped the bed, uh, except for his strikeouts. So it was just like, great. Uh, I had to go like trade a couple draft picks, future draft picks for for Degrom. Uh, Save yeah, my season. Someone else so. had Clevenger and then kept them again this year, I think. Yeah, so it wasn't Clevenger. I know that. Um, all right, moving on here. What do we got? All right. So, um, speaking of young pitchers, let's talk about Frankie Montas. Dude was suspended 80 games last year for taking PEDs. I mean, he had a phenomenal season going until he got his suspension. You know, he was 9-2, and two, um, 263 ERA, 103 Ks, and all that in 96 innings. I mean, is he actually this good, or was it the drugs? Uh, uh-huh. I mean, I don't think it's it can be all attributed to the PEDs. Uh, Montes has a pretty good fastball either way. Um, my, I guess he's not going to pitch to a two six, you know, two six ERA. I don't think, but I don't see why he couldn't go, you know, mid threes with more than a strikeout per inning, which is. You know, valuable enough as, you know, what, SP3, high-end SP4, that kind of thing on your team. Um, yeah, I don't see why you need to... Eh. Even if it was the PEDs, like, he's always had a close to or over a triple-digit fastball, so... Eh. Yeah, he, he's made pretty steady improvements every year. You know, last year was a, a giant jump, uh, especially in the whip column. Uh, I, I do worry that maybe the PEDs helped help his keep his walks down now aj you mentioned pitch count you know innings for for guys i think montez is one of those guys that could get capped at like a 140 um he only pitched 96 and that was his career high so you know you're talking like the normal progression usually add 30 40 innings onto a guy that's kind of where he's going to be at so you do worry about that and i kind of think because of that i'd rather take a couple of the guys behind, like right behind him, who you know could go longer. They've already talked about Lazardo's has got free reign, which kind of doesn't really make any sense. Um, That's a lie. What, I, I know that doesn't make yeah, any sense at all. I don't understand that at all. But you know, like like Wheeler, Wheeler has it. You know, Wheeler's gonna go. He's gonna be steady. He's nothing sexy, but he's steady. Um, you know, he's sexy in those red pinstripes. <laughs> I guess. Um, <laughs> moving on. Uh, you know. Mons is, you know, look, if if it fits my team, you know, I guess if I think about it, right, I mean, the way, the way you look at these guys who have innings limits is is the 140, 130 to 140 innings of him plus the replacement at the end of the year, which who knows who you can get after, you know, that time of the season. Um, you can find some really good guy, you know, good prospects coming up, guys that just randomly get hot toward the end of the season. It could be amazing. You know, that together, is it better than taking a Wheeler? Is it better than taking a Bumgarner around later? That's That's got to be your choice. You know, you've got to know your strength, whether you're good at playing the waiver wire during the season and finding those guys to replace a guy like Montez who's going to get shut down. Or do you need safe, reliable, you don't like to tinker a lot, and to go get Bumgarner, don't worry about it, because he's going to give you 200 innings. You know, that, that's the way you've got to look at it when you put your team together. Um, but I do like Montez's 
uh, skill set, and I think he will be good this year. Um, not nearly as good as last year, like Jonathan was saying. Though that was absurd. So, yeah, I mean, he's basically doubled his innings every year. Uh, obviously, he's not going to double from ninety six to you know one hundred and ninety two, but he'll he's he's going up in that like thirty ish range. So, I mean, I think even even one hundred forty <clears throat> might be high. Um, so well, no, so usually it's like a percentage that you increase. Yeah. Um, so the percentage will be, and it, granted, he would have probably pitched more last year, but he got suspended. So well, keep that in mind. It, yeah, he he would have he would have been higher, but yeah, you know, missing eighty games will make that not possible. So absolutely not. So. All right, let's finish up here with the starting pitching. Uh, the guy who we pegged as the breakout pitcher of the year last year, and AJ wrote the article on him, Lucas Giolito. Uh, he is the guy who I said when we talked about Trevor Bauer that we had a bunch of subpar, poor seasons from him. Um, and then, although way worse than Bauer ever had, I feel like. But... 2019 literally came out of nowhere. Nobody wanted this guy. Um, I don't know what his ADP was last year, but I wouldn't be surprised if he was undrafted in the vast majority of leagues. Um, Came out 3.41 ERA, 220 strikeouts, 176 innings, um, won 14 games for a White Sox team that was better last year, but still not that great. I mean, he was just absurdly good. I mean, are we buying the breakout, or are we kind of taking a step back and going, hold up, he's not really this guy? Uh, I mean, that's a – he lowers ERA by almost three full runs. Yes. That's that's a breakout and a half. That's I mean, he has the pedigree to do this. He was he a was top, a top prospect for, what, for a long time, yeah. For, yeah, for two or three years. Uh, it just you know never came together. He got traded. He was awful in 2018. He put it together, but that's a lot of buy-in for for you know one year breakout. Uh, 47. Uh, that's that's a lot to buy into. You really have to be confident that he's gonna you know stick with that. Um, he, I mean, he did look good. Like he made tangible improvements with his you know his velocity, his pitch mixing, all that kind of stuff, but. Man, after, you know, watching him struggle in the minors and then watching him struggle again in the majors for a couple of years, it's very, very tough to buy in at that price as a 13th pitcher off. Yeah, obviously, as was noted, I wrote the Fantasy Six Pack this year's Lucas Giolito article. Um, quite a quality read. Mind you, go <laughs> check it out on the website. <laughs> little, little pat on plug, the back, <laughs> non shameless plug, <laughs> whatever you want to do. Um, I'm good at writing, so when I do it on time, which is never, uh, but yeah, I mean, at least look he knows. At, <laughs> what's that? I said, at least he knows. <laughs> oh, I know, I don't do anything on time. Um, so yeah, you, you got to go back through his minor league stuff. And, you know, one of the things I noted was he had a ridiculous 92% left on base percentage. It increased his K per nine rate to 675, decreased his walk rate to 2.38. But that was in 2017. And, I mean, he was he was up at that point. Um but the problem there was was his FIP, and it was sitting at a 494, which is two times higher than his ERA. So, you know, overall his stats were better that year, but they still weren't a ton of help fantasy wise. So, you go back to last year, and I mean, it just something clicked. He put it all together. I mean, his his home run per nine dropped. Uh, you know, he had a, his left on base percentage went back up uh, to 77 and a, uh, 77.7, almost 78. You know, his ER, ERA and FIP both settled in right in line with each other. So, 
that's what you want to see. But the craziest stat that I think helped this breakout so much was that he nearly doubled his K per nine from six and a half to 11 and two thirds. I mean, that's his highest rate ever between both minors and majors. So it's, it's just unprecedented to see that big of a jump. I mean, it's very, you know, I don't want to say Bauer esque, but the fact that Bauer just put everything in and it was like, Oh shit. Okay. Now I'm doing something. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if, if Giolito went through the same kind of progression of just tweaking his pitches around or what, but getting back to the point, I don't know if I will own him this year. I feel like people are just going to be jumping on this train from what he put up last year. And I don't blame him, but you know, that there's definitely some regression ready to come his way um i I think his era settles in closer to maybe like a three six um the whip is going to go up a little bit but if the strikeouts are there you know i i think that that's that's going to be the big defining factor for his season yeah, the one thing I'll add to that is that, you know, Jonathan, you mentioned, like, his, his pitching repertoire, right? So he increased the, – the main difference between all of his other years and, and last year was he lowered his curveball um, to 4.1%. It was upwards – you know, it was around the 10% range of usage in the previous two years. And he increases changeup usage up to 26% of the time. Yeah. And it was around the 15, 16% range in, in before that. And like, it just, you know, it, I, I'm, I'm reading some stats where like, it got, you know, a 22.2% swinging strike rate, which is ridiculous. Um, you know, his curveball, like I mentioned, kind of just died off and probably for a good reason because it was getting smashed. Um, in a lot of point four one nine woba, um, so it, it was a good pitch to let go is what. So if you know, maybe hitters adjust to that, knowing that that changeup is coming more and he's not going to throw the curve as much. Um, but maybe that's why we buy into the breakout. I don't know if I will, but it, I, I think that's why he's still being ranked higher than I usually do for a breakout guy because you see the change. It's not just like randomness. It's not like everything's kind of the same. It just kind of worked for him this year. It's like, no, something changed. It's like when Arietta all of a sudden became really good. Something changed in him. He changed his pitching, and he was amazing for a few years. That might be what Giolito turns into. So, yeah. All right, let's move on here to some all right. relievers. AJ, Relief pitchers. Uh, also, uh, unshameless plug, the Fantasy Six Pack 2020 Closer Chart is finally, finally revamped and relaunched. So go to the site, check that out, and um, it probably won't be updated for uh, at least a month at this rate. Um, a, because I'm slow with majority of things, but B, because there's not going to be baseball. No so, baseball. so yeah, as news comes out, I'll. I'll tweak what i can but you know i i threw it out there and uh first guy we get to talk about here we've already mentioned him a couple of times is mr josh Hader. so he definitely kind of faded down the stretch last season and he he still finished the second half with you know a 331 era but he blew a handful of saves and you know I don't know. He, he's still being drafted as the top closer. Should he be, or is he being worn down too much? Is that is that a worry for you, Jonathan, or do you not care about his usage last year? No, I'm not super concerned about it. Hater is still the the number one closer. I don't think you can count kind of that that workload. I think last year, um, obviously, he wore down a little bit uh, pitching the amount of innings that he did, but Drafting him, uh, you know what you're getting. You're going to get, you know, those 30, maybe close to 40 saves, over 100 Ks, and out of your, 
you know, a reliever, that's incredible. Because, you know, if you're going down closer to the, uh, you know, the, the doldrums of starters, you're looking at, you know, 6K9 guys that are getting you, you know, 130 innings a year. And Hater does the same thing uh, with a much better, with much better ratios. Um, what might work in his favor this year is Corey Knebel's back. Uh, so I think in those situations where, you know, Hato is pitching two innings, you know, mm-hmm. two and a bit, he can get some of that load taken off and now he can pitch, you know, higher leverage. He can, he won't wear down toward the end of the year. He has somebody to take that load off and, uh, hopefully it leads to more saves or at least, you know, better, better ratios on the stretch. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been... I've had Hader on, on in the dynasty league that we're both in, Jonathan, for you know a couple of years now, and, and just kind of held on to him. I, I honestly was kind of worried about him down the stretch. He was giving me negative points a couple of games because he was blowing so many saves. Uh, but I mean, you got to ride him because he's so good. Um, you know, I, you do you see it with these relievers though, where they get used these extraordinarily amount of pitches. Um, or the innings for multiple years, and it just it catches up to them quick because it's not like a starter where they're coming in and, and they're they're built for these long, you know, lots of innings. They they mix their pitches up and, and things like that. These guys are throwing gas almost every pitch, so it is heavy, heavy. Um, uh, what's the right word? Um, use on the arm, right? It's it's just a lot. A lot on that arm, so I think Hader deserves to be the top reliever, but I think I'm just scared off by what happened near the end of last year enough that I'm I will not have him. Uh, I, I'd, I'd rather take somebody else a little bit later and catch up in strikeouts. I I'll love the strikeout potential from him, but you know I'd rather catch up a little a little later with some of my starters. But he's great, though. I, he's phenomenal, regardless. Uh, yeah. Wanna, sorry, you want I mean, to add something? I was just going to say real quick. I, if you're going to be drafting a pitcher in that spot, I think you're taking a starter that's going to get you those strikeouts and more and and similar ratios. Maybe not as good, but yeah, I, I think the wear and tear on on him last year is taking a toll so it'll be interesting to see how he bounces back this year and then you know with this this break potentially how that factors in with these guys i mean are they gonna need to like redo a week of spring training to get them back going or i mean pitchers obviously may need a little longer than that but I probably won't be taking Hater this year personally because I owned him last year too and I got burned in that second half. So I faded him. <laughs> All right, moving on here to the next guy on our list is Archie Bradley, Arizona Diamondbacks closer to, to close out the year. He was pretty good, man. Um, over the last month and a half, he had 18 saves. That's a pretty crazy number. Um, yeah, for some reason, he's still being drafted really low. I mean, 157th overall. Um, I mean, I know the ratios weren't great. I mean, 3.5, 1.44. Um, I mean, the strikeouts are fine, 87 and 71. I mean, I mean, I, Arizona's got a good offense, and I think they're going to win plenty of games. Jonathan, why, why do you think he's going so low? I mean, do you agree with it or dis- disagree with it? Um... I'm on the fence about Bradley. I think uh, there's a couple of reasons he's being drafted low. The first is that Arizona over the last couple of years has done everything they could to keep him out of that job. Uh, they just kept bringing people in and Greg Holland, of all people, to keep Archie Bradley out of that closest Ugh. job. Um, and he obviously didn't work out, so Bradley got the job. Um, so I think if Arizona finds a different, you know, maybe a younger reliever to throw into the closer role, they might do that because they prefer Bradley as that, you know, that fireman to put out, you know, across whatever situations. That's fair. The second reason uh, I think he's going low is that, I don't know, his performance, he got the saves, but I think a lot of it didn't really inspire that much confidence. He was walking, you know, four and a half guys per nine innings, uh, just so many more uh 
walks than he had in 2018, where he was really, really good. Uh, he walked, you know, s- just under se- just under seven uh, in 2018, and then in seven uh, percent, sorry, uh, walk rate, and then last year jumped up to 11 hmm. percent. So there were some control issues, and then a little bit inconsistency. I think that's kind of turning people away. Um, we know he has the stuff to be to be good. It's just, will he be consistent? He's never been the most consistent pitcher either way. But I think, yeah, he, there's there's uh, some of that. I guess doubt built into that ADP, and around where he's going, I think that's it's fair. Cool. I don't have a whole lot to add, AJ. Anything? Uh, yeah. I mean, I I think the big thing to take away from this is that um, he he really doesn't have much behind him anymore. Um, he had. I'm trying to page through the thing to find the right team. Uh, uh, Hirano was behind him last year, and he's there now anymore. he's gone. Yeah. So Seattle, he I think, right? Yeah, he's over in Seattle. But I mean, Kevin Ginkle is still there, and he he pitched a little bit towards the end of last year. Um, they brought in Hector Rondon, who has closed out some games here and there. Um, but it, there's just nothing really exciting behind him. So I think that just further stabilizes him in this role, even though he's not really a great, you know, sexy option, like like he said. So, all right, moving on to a potentially sexier option, Mr. Liam Hendricks. Dude was crazy good last year. I mean, he recorded 25 saves from the end of June on. So, two months into the season, three months into the season, three months. really. Yeah, he barely he got he, like a save oh, near the very end of June. He 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 was phenomenal. Uh, he struck out 124 batters in 85 innings. So the A's are not really known for, or are are known for not having closers last from season to season. So, Jonathan, do you think Ken Hendricks can actually buck that trend? I think he. I, well, obviously, I don't think he's going to be as good as he was last year. Like you said, he was phenomenal. ERA under two, uh, 124 strikeouts. I think he showed enough improvement that he could. I think he can. Um, maintain it he did make some you know tangible improvements he had a velocity bump which is always big for closers and the same kind of thing with you mentioned with bradley he doesn't have a lot behind him he's got petite and soria behind him i mean soria has been a closer for what seems like 35 years now and i don't <laughs> think he's going to be taking hendrix's job him so. and Cologne. like why are they still around <laughs> yeah uh it's i think he if hendrix can be <laughs> just average and like an average reliever like ERA round three, I think he'll maintain it. I don't think he's going to get saves at the same rate he was last year. I, th- I don't think that's sustainable. But, uh, yeah, he's, he. I, I think he'll be fine. Uh, obviously not as good as last year, but at 91st, sure. I can see it. Yeah, I, I, I'm not trying to give too much away here, but I guess i got to say it just because, you know, we're here. We're here for the people. Hendricks is by far my closer target as one of my top guys um i'm gonna pass on hater in most cases um hendrix is like one of those top guys that if i had to go get one you're talking 91st overall maybe a little later um i'm gonna take him every day because i i think the potential is there to just be as good as hater um he's got the stuff man that's all there is to it and you're right the velocity bump was incredible um Changes pitching repertoire just just slightly um, <clears throat> added added the curveball even more back in to his game so it's all there for him to just be awesome again so yeah I mean dude's thirty one um, so I mean he's kind of coming into pitching prime almost um, and especially as a reliever I mean you look back through some of his his previous seasons I mean he's kind of been around. He, played with the twins you know then then was over with the blue jays for um, 
little bit, and, and then he's been with the A's since 2016. Um, I mean, he's had only two seasons with double-digit K per nine, both with the A's in 17, and then last year was as highest by far, you know, thir- just over 13. Um, he still does walk a decent amount of guys. Uh, you know, it's his, not too bad, his though. ERA. No, it's not bad. You know, j- over just over two per nine. So that's dropped from the two previous years. You know, over a batter, batter and a half. So that's that's stuff you'd like to see. And and as a later target, absolutely, absolutely love having him. Yeah. So, all right, Jonathan, we we got a, a couple last questions here. So, <clears throat> kind of alluded to it a little earlier in the show where. You know, taking some of those guys, like if you if you don't go heavy closers, right? Um, is there a guy, a backup, who you are all in on, or maybe a couple guys that you really like, who are who are right now the backup closer or the setup man that you would 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 jump at? Um, I guess I don't know if he's going to go super late anymore, but. Dallin Betances of the Mets uh, after what Edwin Diaz did last year um, I don't know if you could trust him ever again uh, I know he was incredible in 2018 but just having Betances behind him instead of you know just Familia and Seth Lugo as a as a as a fallback mm-hmm. I think that's gonna he won't have as, as long a leash uh, as he did last year uh, Diaz that is and I think if he struggles again anywhere to start the year whenever that happens to be I think Betances is a good uh, you know high ceiling option as we saw with the Yankees all those years yeah like I, I said Scott Oberg is one because I, I think Wade Davis is just they're really they Awful. paid him a lot of money so they're giving him the job to start the season but like again I don't think it's going to last very long um, AJ you got anybody on the tip of your tongue to, to mention um I mean, there's two backups that I like as as high upside guys, but they're completely cock blocked. Um, and that's Blake Tranian, if he can get it back together, but he's behind Kenley Jansen. Uh, Emilio Pagan was really good last year for Tampa, but he's behind Kirby Yates. So neither of them are worth mentioning. Um, <laughs> yeah, you did. Andrew Miller is. <laughs> the interesting one because <coughs> Carlos Martinez is back to potentially fighting for a rotation spot this year um, I took him off of the closer chart altogether but you had Giovanni uh, Gallegos mm-hmm. and he pitched really well down the stretch Miller was kind of garbage last year Yeah, um, after having a ton of success out of the bullpen as kind of that like complete bridge guy um, and, and also coming in and getting saves when he needed to you know he was kind of a just a utility reliever um, we saw it in Baltimore uh, you know he was he did it a little bit in, in Boston as well he just didn't have it last year though um, so I, I think he's past his issues for this year um and you also have jordan hicks who's on the il but he'll be back at some point you know earlier to to mid-season um so i think i think miller's the guy to watch honestly i think he's going to be someone that can definitely jump in and and take the reins back yeah it was just before I move on, one more name that I thought of is Daniel Hudson for Washington because, um, yeah, you know, Doolittle's cool been injured a lot lately, it feels like. so. All right, so the last question that we have is, how do you think this new pitching rule where you can't get a guy out of the game until after he's faced three batters uh, is really, you know, how do you think this is going to affect you know, targeting closers or holds guys? Uh, I think this might help kind of, I guess, extinguish the whole 
closer acts as a fireman thing, closer faces the best batters. Because if you can only have your closer in for three outs, then maybe managers will start to go back to, you know, have him for the ninth, right? Well, no, so it's so, they have to be in there for at least three batters. They have yeah, to face okay. at least three batters before they can get pulled. So it's no more go in for one guy, you face a lefty-righty guy, oh, pull him because now there's a lefty coming up and... Yeah, that's thing. what I mean, though. So the guys where there are bullpens that are, like, maybe kind of contested, you know you're going to have one guy in there, you know, for the ninth. So I think they're, I don't think there are going to be as many contested bullpens for the ninth. I think we're going to see more clear-cut kind of saves guys come in, and it won't be as many scrambles as there were in the last couple of years. Gotcha. Thanks, Rays. <laughs> yeah, well, they'll still, they'll still do openers. <laughs> Everybody will hate them. So fair enough, fair enough. All right, so let's finish up here. We've got our over and undervalued. We'll start with our overvalued. So give us one starter and one reliever who you think is currently overvalued, being drafted higher than he should. Okay, uh, overvalued, uh, I'm going to go with Jack Flaherty. Uh, I know he was incredible second half of last year. I'm not taking anything away from that. But it was one half of success. Like, literally one half of success. And he's being taken in top five or close to it. Yeah, number uh, six right now. It, it's that's really high. Like he had, he was. I mean, he was absolutely dominant for that half. But that's really high to take somebody who you know what eighty innings of good ball. It's 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 too much. He's a good pitcher, but that's way way too expensive. All right, yeah. AJ. Who's the other? Um, yeah, I am going with Mister Chris Paddock. Um, again, we're looking at maybe an innings limit. He's probably on the borderline of not really having one, though. He pitched 140 and two-thirds last year. Uh, so he'll probably jump up. But granted, he only had 90, 87, 88 innings the, in 2018 between you know single and double A. Um, so... That's a pretty big jump as it is there. I mean, look, the guy was really good. Um, you know, his his strikeouts per nine were just under 10. Um, you know, his walks per nine were just under two. But his homers were still at one and a half um, per nine. So, I mean, that's, that's not terrible. Um, his ERA was at, at 333, but his FIP was up near four. So that just kind of scares me a little bit. I don't know if he was just getting, you know, really lucky or not. I mean, his BABIP was all the way down at 237. So I think he's somebody that I'm just going to stay away from based on his current ADP. Yeah, I uh, I do like that one. I think people are kind of overhyping the, you know, the prospect. You know, he was great last year, but I think people are overhyping a little bit. Mine's going to be Jose Barrios. Um, I just, I don't, the, to me, he's just a guy. I mean, he doesn't overpower you with the strikeouts. Um, I mean, the walker, he's, he's good, but it's just like, I think... At that point, you know, I, I'd like to take a chance on a guy who could, like, be a difference maker for me. You know, hell, I might take a Bauer over him. You know, get those extra 50 strikeouts possibly that Barrios can get me um, and hope the ERA comes down a little bit for Bauer. Um, but Barrios to me is just a, it's just another guy. You know, it's a, a mid-three ERA uh, you know, eight, eight and a half to nine strikeout rate, which is fine. Um, you know, whip is, is overall solid, you know, one, one, five to one, two range. There's a million guys like Jose Barrios. So I, I, I think people are, are really buying into like, he's going to be the next guy. And we just haven't seen it happen yet. Maybe, you know, he's 25 turning 26 this year. Maybe this is the year he does it. But we're, you're paying for the he's going to do it than over guys who have already done it. <laughs> so uh, I'll pass. All right, so Jonathan, who's your reliever? Uh, overvalued reliever. I mean, I was going to say Wade Davis. 
uh, <laughs> just because. But <laughs> it's like not being drafted, but he's still being overdrafted. <laughs> yes, because somebody will take him because he's officially the closer. So he is being drafted. So he's overrated. Uh, my other one was also I has Edwin Diaz, but I mentioned him already. Uh, you know, he had a bad year last year, and he's still being drafted as a top ten closer, which I'm not sure about. I mean, yeah, like I said, he was good, but who knows? Um, I guess another one. Uh, I don't know if I like uh, Roberto Ozuna, where he's going. He's going pretty high, just pitchers in general. Uh, he's going 80th overall. I know that Houston's been a good place to get saves, but with everything going on in Houston and, you know, uh, you don't know how he's going to react. He's never been the most, you know, mentally strong person, pitcher, human being uh, with all the other stuff that goes on with him. So <laughs> I don't know how they're going to handle the scandal. Um, I don't you know how many games that Houston's going to win, but I think at 80th overall, I think you're paying a little bit uh, too much for, for Ozuna. So AJ, you got anything else to add for that? <laughs> you totally snaked AJ's. That's cool. Sure. Um, Sorry. Yeah. You don't have to no, pick another one. You can just move on. Just, just add to it. That, I mean, the reason that I had Ozuna on here is, I mean, really, he's only had one year and I was 2017 where he had a really low FIP, but a kind of trumped up ERA at a 174 to 338 respectively. But every other year his FIP has been, you know, well above his ERA. And I, I mean, just looking at, at his homers per nine last year, he was at a 111. Yeah, his K's per nine were at 10, 11, but if you're giving up over a homer per inning, I mean, I don't want you as my reliever. I don't want you on my fantasy team because you're going to you're gonna hurt me. You're not going to get me as many points as you should, and you're going to get beat around. So I just don't think his ratios are as good as they've appeared the last couple of years. Um and granted, in, in 18, he had kind of a shortened season, um, only pitching 38 innings. But, yeah, I, I just don't I don't like Ozuna either. I think he's he's getting picked up way too high for where he's at. Yeah, so so mine's Craig Kimbrell. Um, you know, he's fallen into that next tier range, you know, right behind Iglesias and right above Cologne and, and the, like the newcomer Nick Anderson. I don't have all of those guys. I have no idea why he's in that range. Um, Kimbrell was a disaster last year, almost a 7 ERA. Um, sure, he's the closer for the Cubs. The Cubs are going to win a fair number of games. Yeah, it, you know, he, His velocity is, is down, so he's not able to pitch. You know, We saw this coming in 2018. He was able to pitch around it, but you know, the walks were way up. Um, you mentioned the home runs, AJ. The, eight, the home runs for Kimbrel were almost at four per nine. He was getting hammered. Uh, I can't do it. I, I, I stupidly auto drafted. Thank you, Fantrax, for not being able to email from your system. But uh, I had him at the top of my queue because I didn't have my queue in order. I just had people in it. Um, and I missed my pick in the slow draft and auto drafted Kane, Craig Kimbrel. So I hope I'm wrong, but. I don't think I'm going to be <laughs> like, um, I just want nothing to do with Kimball this year. So, all right. Undervalued, uh, Jonathan, give us your undervalued starting pitcher. Well, let's just have you rip off both and then we'll just move on. All right. Yeah. Let's uh, see, see, see what I can do. Uh, be like last year when I ripped off all your shortstops. Yeah. <laughs> um, undervalued starter, uh, Corey Kluber. I think, he his 2019 was just too full of injuries to really knock him down to where to where he's going. Uh, I mean, he starts slow every year, so you can't say there was a you know a decline in his skills. Uh, he's going 90th or 89.8 right now, but you know every April he starts super slow. ERA is above four. You know five of the last six years. Uh, this time he had you know forearm fracture and bleak injury ruined his season. Um, you know, but he finished, you know, before 2019, he finished the year with sub three ERAs, you know, both times in 2017, 2018. Uh, he's going to the Rangers, uh, where a good offense is going to help him pick up some extra wins. 
their new ballpark has humidor, has some climate control, so the ball won't fly out like it did in the in the old park. So I think great great value outside the top twenty starters right now. Fair enough. Uh, who's your reliever? Uh, Keon Kella for oh. the uh, Pirates. Um, he's going super low. The Pirates have been a saves factory uh, for another. Uh, I'm not even going to say his name. I just can't stand uh, their old closer after what yes. he did now. So uh. not dealing with that guy. But uh, yeah, Pirates, they're saves factory. They're going to play a lot of close games. Uh, the offense is getting better with Brian Reynolds and you know all the, all the young guys coming up. So I think... Kell has been solid enough uh, throughout his career that he can rack up a good number of saves and not absolutely destroy your ratios. All right. AJ, what you got? Starter All right. and reliever. So I've got a reliever or starter? Both. Give, give. Oh. Just starter, um, I wrote about him in the uh, the Lucas Giolito article, uh, and that's Lance Lynn. Um, I mean, he pitched for the Rangers last year, which – is usually not a friendly ballpark to pitch in, but he hit uh, double digits in Ks per nine, back over 10, um, over 10 and a half, actually. Uh, his highest total since his first uh, first season back in 2011 with the Cardinals. Uh, he did have a kind of high walk ratio. ERA was, uh, you know, 367, which isn't terrible, but his FIP was lower, so... You know, hopefully that's that's a little more telling. Um, I mean, he's a ground ball guy, so still at over forty percent ground balls, sixteen wins. You know, in thirty three games. So if you're winning half of your games, that helps. He's an innings eater, two hundred eight innings last year. Um, I mean, I know he's had his his issues with injuries in the past, but you know, he's he's been good since he's been in Texas. Um, and there, there's nothing not to like there, especially where he's going. Um, I think I had him at around 200, something like that. Oh no, I'm sorry, one 124 ish. So around around tenth round, you know, it's still still pretty solid. All right. Um, and then, oh shit! I just closed the wrong window. Uh, my my reliever is actually going to be uh, Ian Kennedy. Um, I I don't know if I've ever thought that I would say that, but I mean, look, once Kennedy got put into this reliever role, he finally thrived. I mean, he he's been up and down as a starter, but he just he excelled and i mean i think kansas city is is a team that's not going to get a ton of wins but the wins they get are probably going to be close games so i really like his upside and um i don't know why this isn't coming back up anymore come on so yeah i like kennedy (laughs) fair enough enough. in front of me it's all good. Uh, so, all right, my starter here is going to be Mr. X Oriole, Dylan Bundy. I mean, this guy had a high, you know, pedigree coming out of the minors, you know, and stuff like that. And he's supposed to be, you know, he, we've seen flashes where Bundy's been amazing with the home run ball, especially in Camden Yards, just got the better of him. Um, I loved the move to L.A. as soon as it happened for him. I, I don't Truly know what to expect from him. I'm not expecting like a Giolito type breakout from him, but I, I think we're going to see Bundy be pretty special this year. Um, and in the spring, even against pretty solid opponents, uh, you know, baseball reference kind of gave me the, the, they rate the, 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 the batters that he faces. And it's, it's at a 7.7, which 10 is the highest. And like really nobody has over like a eight and a half. So it's, pretty up there as far as quality opponent faced he's got a 1.59 era with 16 strikeouts in 11.1 innings i mean can't ask for much better uh you know i i think bundy is is just getting out of camden yards getting off a pretty crummy team and you know just being a better park market he's, he's gonna he's gonna shine this year uh my reliever uh you know you mentioned wade davis johnson where it's just like 
he's getting drafted just because he is a closer. Well, my guy who is really kind of right down there with Wade Davis is Mark Melanson. He's not getting drafted that much either. Will Smith is going ahead of him, and I get it. Will Smith is the better pitcher. I get it, but he's not the closer. Mark Melanson is. And honestly, Melanson's not terrible. He's had bad seasons, but he was pretty good last year. Um, he's had really good seasons, too. He's had really phenomenal seasons. I don't think he's that guy from you know, 2012 20, or 2013, you know, even 2014. But I think he can be serviceable in the closer role for a long time this year for the Braves. Long enough that you should draft him way ahead of where he's going. He's going like almost dead last in the closer ranks. Just because everybody expects Will Smith to take this job, but I don't know how he does if Melanson just converts saves. Will Smith could be that, hey, go get us out of the fire in the eighth, not, eighth, seventh, eighth inning and type of thing because he's the better guy. And Melanson just shuts the door. So I wouldn't just turn a blind eye to Melanson in your drafts because everybody thinks Will Smith is better. So. All right, Jonathan, uh, that's all we got for the show. Um, go ahead and remind everybody where they can find you on the internet and kind of uh, what we intend to have <laughs> on, the, on the site coming up here once <laughs> things get back to normal, hopefully. Uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter at uh, jchat underscore 811. Uh, we've got a bunch of stuff coming up, uh, like spring training updates or I guess spring training wrap-ups, as it were, now. Uh, come up with injuries, position battles, that kind of stuff. Uh, Tyler, uh, now Tyler Thompson, mainstay at the site. He's going to be uh, coming up with some good stuff uh, in the next week. And uh, please, if you have any questions, arguments, you're bored, come talk to me because I'm real bored with all the sports. So, uh, <laughs> jchat underscore a one guys. Come on. Sounds good, man. All right, well, uh, thanks for coming on. It's a pleasure to have you on. We always, we always, we always enjoy it. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks for having me. All right, see you. Absolutely. Ya. Thanks, Tyler. All right, AJ. Well, this was a long one, so I think we're going to cut it short here at the end. Nothing to really add. Um, hopefully sports comes back soon. Yes. Keep an eye on Twitter. I'll let you know if we have a show next week. Uh, we got to talk to the potential guests and see if the topics even make any sense to have. Who knows at this point? <laughs> but uh, have a good night, everybody. Good week, whatever. And um, stay safe. See ya.